In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, I have one of the top shooters, not only one of the top international shooters, but one of the top shooters, period, in the 2023 draft class. Shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online because Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. Happy Monday to each and every person out there listening. Hope you had a good weekend. Hope you had a good Halloween weekend, even though Halloween is today. I had a pretty decent weekend. I am your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies.com. And if you know anything about NBA Draft Junkies.com, I kind of made a name for myself by knowing the international prospects. I fell in love with international basketball and just how different it is than basketball in the States and trying to figure out, okay, if this international player, would he be good in Nike's EYBL? Would this guy be good playing? at a division one school could he contribute at a power five school does he have a skill set that would make him a reliable player in the nba and in this case my guest is someone that i believe has what it takes to be a reliable player in the nba a little under the radar i still don't understand why he's not getting enough buzz and attention but this is what i'm here for so my guest today is Fedor Fedor Zhukic. Did I say it right? I, I know I was. I've been yeah, practicing. you said it right. Yeah, that's perfect. One of the best shooters in this class. Thank you so much, man, for coming on. How how is everything going for you this season so far? I mean, the season's been pretty good for me personally for the team. Uh, we didn't start uh, start as we wanted to, but you know we are a pretty young team, so it takes a little bit of time for us to you know, get to know each other better. And we had a pretty bad off season because all the guys are playing for the national teams. But yesterday we had our first win in the BBL German League and we had a pretty huge win against Venice a couple of weeks ago. So I think we are going in a good direction right now. A big win led by two teenagers. How often does that happen? <laughs> I mean, uh, not, not, not very often. I mean, I'm watching my guys, the young players from Europe. Nobody's really getting a chance right now. So... To be able to play with uh, a guy or like with uh, in this class, Juan, uh, who is a year younger than me and me, and to be able to lead a team in uh, Euro Cup games is it's a blessing for you. Like it's it's I think it's never been seen before, and I mean not like in a long time at least, you know. So it's 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 a nice feeling. Yeah. So I'll get into that in another segment about. Young guys not necessarily giving the opportunity, but I wanted to give the audience um, an update, at least some information about you that I have. And tell me if you agree or disagree. These are my notes that I have. These are notes that I took last season. So okay. um, I, I thought that you were a, a good candidate for the 22 NBA draft, but you, you would only been, would you, would you have been 19 or 18 if you were drafted this summer? Uh, I was supposed to be among, yeah, that among 20s, I, I, I guess. But then at the end of the season, I had a lot of, um, first I had ankle injury, then I had Corona two times. So oh. I kind of went back a little bit. So my, my goal was always like the first round, if I can get the first round, fight for the first round. But then after not playing consistently last two months of the season, I was really happy with being like among 33, 35, 37, you know, so I wasn't really happy with that. And uh, I talked with my agent and we said, uh, go back next year and fight for that first round. So that's why I'm in Germany right now and, you know, hoping for the best. Yeah, because you would have only been 18. So you just turned 19 in September, I just correct? turned 19, yes. Okay, yes, so you're yes. still pretty young, which, you know, in the States you have guys that are – seniors in high school at 19 and you're playing professional basketball. All right. So here are my notes that I had last year. Very good shooter from deep Defined NBA role as a specialist. I have that you are a good ball mover. You have good passing instincts, good feel for the game. You can make plays out of ball screens. You're not just a, a spot up shooter. If they put you in pick and rolls, you can make plays there. You play hard. And here's something that really stood out to me. Like shooters sometimes have this reputation of being just shooters. 
but you play hard and you make these hustle and these energy plays. Like you have this energy, like a scrappy role player. So I thought that was a pretty interesting combination there. I put you have a good first step that you can attack closeouts. You love to get to your one dribble pull up and shoot that. Um, you move well off the ball. And I thought that that alone right there at 18 years old should have been enough to at least get you in, in the draft. But now it makes more sense why you decided to come back. So, I mean, you could be honest with me. Do you think my notes on you were pretty accurate? Or is there something yeah. else that you would have liked to add? I think that was pretty accurate, especially what you said. I hate when people call me just a shooter, like he's a catch a shooter. I hate that, like. Because I've, I've been working so hard on my pick and roll game and also my passing and also like driving inside. Um, I worked on it a lot, especially in the States this summer. And I think that was one of my greatest weapons when I was younger because I wasn't always a shooter, you know. Um, when I was young, I was always like a driving guy. I was never really able to shoot the ball. And then when I uh, went to play basketball professionally, then they told me, hey, man, you need to start shooting the ball. So that's when I kind of realized that I can shoot the ball good. So, you know, when you're a young player and you go to a team, you don't get really much of a freedom to do a lot of stuff with the ball and screen. So all you can do is really catch and shoot. Yep. And I was really good at catch and shoot. So they said, oh, he's a good catch and shoot shooter. I'm like, no, I'm not just a shooter. I can do all these things. And especially this season, I'm happy that I, that I proved that I can, you know, drive the ball pretty well, uh, finish at the rim, uh, find the right pass, you know, find my teammates, play pick and roll and do all that kind of stuff to to make my team better. Yeah, and I think that having that part of your game is going to help because um, oops. I know, like, it's easy to put somebody in the box that shoots the ball well as just a shooter, right? But then there are guys that are very good shooters, but then – once the defense is starting to pay attention to them, they can't put the ball on the floor and they can't do anything else. And so I think for you, it's probably good that the shooting was kind of like the last step of your development in a sense, that you were a scorer first. And now, I mean, I think your calling card to the NBA will be as a shooter, but they can't just put you in a box and say, all right, just hard close out and we can kind yeah. of – you know, take him out of his game because also you can shoot on the move, which I don't know a lot of people understand how difficult it is to be able to shoot on the move. So was that something that you worked on just like coming off screens or, or was that like a, a emphasis when you decided to like really focus on shooting? When I moved to Um, uh, that's when I met coach Yakolakovic and uh, we got a bunch of good playmakers that first year and he told me, I need you to be able to shoot off the move. And I need you to be able to shoot it consistently. And that off season and, and also preseason with the team was like every, before every practice and after every practice, I would shoot three, four, five hundred shots off the move every day. Wow. So it was like really, really hard work with Coach Jakovic and also his assistant coaches. And um, when the season started, he would call all these plays for, for, for me. And also for other guys on the team, but it was mostly for me to shoot off the ball, off the moment. And, you know, at the beginning, it was like really hard, you know, and after you kind of get used to it, you know, it's all about muscle memory and, and, and just habit, you know, so later it was easier. So, you know, right now that's what I'm, because every team knows that I'm a, that if I go off a curl, I will look to shoot it. So now when they hedge on me, I can drive, I can, you know, so, that was kind of what I what I wanted to do this year, you know. Yeah, and, and so far it's working. I mean, like you said, you're yeah. 19 years old. You're playing in the Euro Cup. I don't know if the United States audience understands the difference between basketball and Europe. Like I had a tweet a couple of days ago. Where I was trying to explain to this audience that the Euro League is not just one league. Like I, I listened to a podcast, and it was so frustrating to me that these guys were talking about international prospects playing in the Euro League. And I'm like, it's very rare that you see international prospect playing in the Euro League, definitely playing minutes. I mean, Luca was an exception. When Miyama played a little bit last year, other than that, you're not going to see young players. But most people just think the Euro League is just one league in all of Europe. Yeah. So I was trying to explain that there's the Euro League, which is only 18 teams. Then there's every country has a domestic league. And then there's the Euro Cup. But I still don't know if people understand that 
the games are mean a little bit more because there's no draft. Like there's no incentive for losing. So yeah, teams don't yeah, really yeah. have a reason to play young guys unless that young guy is better than somebody that is 25 yeah, yeah. or 26. Yeah. I think we're just so used to we have in the States, we have high school basketball, then we have college basketball, and then after that, it's the NBA. And in the NBA, if your team is bad, you'll play young guys because not only do you want to develop them, but if they're bad too, then you can get a draft pick. That helps yeah. you get – so I think a lot of people have a hard time understanding that the basketball is totally different. And seeing young guys play major minutes on a team that is looking to compete is is rare. All right, when we return, I'll ask Fedor a little bit about his background by playing for the national team and maybe just a little bit about growing up in Europe and their basketball development. But first, I want to talk to you about Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for betting football and the start of the new basketball season. Find all of the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth analysis on every game. And as always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all of your sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. It is the fastest and the easiest way to check in on all of your favorite games and events, including Major League Baseball, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today. And use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online. It is where the game starts. Once again, shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. Now, for your second listen, check out Locked On Sports today. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports today. It is available on this app, YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with my guest, Fedor Zucic. Zucic, Zucic, Zucic. <laughs> I'm so glad that he has taken time to sit down and chat with me. All right, so tell me a little bit about your background. So you're from, are you from Montenegro? Yes, yes, I'm from Montenegro. Um, that's where I was born. And my first club was also from Montenegro, Buduchnost. I played there for uh eight years uh that's when i made my professional debut also in the euro league and like in general my professional debut uh played professionally for two years and then then i came to home and yeah that's my current club who's the top basketball player there is it um miritich would, would he be... yeah Vuc, Vuc from uh, uh from chicago Vucevic. Oh, okay so i think yeah. So for and and I guess it's kind of like a, a geographic a geography lesson or maybe even yeah. history lesson. So Montenegro is that part of was that part of the um, the breakup of the USSR? Was it one of the countries that split? And that's why like Serbia is a little different. It was it was Yugoslavia at first. Oh, that's right, Yuga, and, Yugoslavia. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, and then after Yugoslavia breakup, Serbia and Montenegro were one country. And then from, I think, 2000-ish, something like that, they broke up into two uh, countries. So now it's Montenegro, and then it's Serbia separate. Now, is Miritic, is he, like, is he from Montenegro? M Miritic is from Montenegro, but I think he, he uh, uh, I think his parents are from Serbia, so I don't know how he is going to, you and know. He represents something. Spain, right? He represented Spain, but it, it was like a lot of things that went down to him in our national team uh, when he was young. I don't really know the full story, but I think um, there was like a beef between him and the Federation. So he left and then as a young player, he was playing in Spain and then Spain offered him a, a spot in the roster. So he said yes. So, I mean, that's that's why he didn't play for, for, for Montenegro. Yeah, the funny thing is, so it was a few years ago, it was probably like 2018, and Bogdan Bogdanovich is someone that I consider a friend. And so I went to a game, and I was talking to Bogdan. So this is when he played for the Kings, and Miritic played for the Bulls. So I was talking to Bogdan, and then Miritic came and were and they were having a conversation, but they were speaking, I guess, Serbian. <laughs> yeah, Serbian, Serbian, yeah. yeah. And so in my, at the time, I always – thought of my uh Miritic as Spanish I thought because you know he came from he, he came from Spain before he got to the NBA then he represented Spain and then that's when I did the research like oh okay this is a little bit different but that's that's a totally different story <laughs> all right so growing up in, in Montenegro is basketball the the main sport there 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, uh, it's a country of 600,000 citizens. So small for us country. to be able, yeah, really small country. And for us to be able to play EuroLeague a couple of years ago was a, was a huge deal. You know, all the money that we have as a state uh, for sports is invested in basketball. So growing up there as a young player was so hard because all they wanted was results because they invest so much money into these players who need to contribute to winning these uh, domestic leagues, Euro Cups, to be playing uh, Euro Leagues. And then and also the, the crowd is, is, is very tough. And, you know, the Serbian crowds are are very crazy. Uh, I think yes. you heard about it already. I've been. So, I've been. I went to a Fenerbahce yeah. Red Star game. Uh, this was 2017. And it was yeah. at the old old arena <laughs> yeah i saw I, a, I saw a cat in the arena <laughs> and uh i've i've I'm, I'm not a guy that gets scared of much but there that game i was kind of scared because i didn't realize that there's a little history between um serbian fans and turkish teams and yeah. so got to the arena like hour before the game and i mean they're just jumping up and down and they're, they're going crazy and um it was just a, and I, I saw the videos on my phone. So what made me a little bit scared was I saw how intense the rivalry was, and I knew that um, Obradovich had, you know, he's Serbian, and then I knew yeah. um, Bogdan and Nikola Kalinic are also Serbian and, and all that. So they yeah. were kind of coming home, but then I guess there was some, I don't know, it was something extra going on. But it's it's, it's also Obradovich is Serbian, but he's uh, he was the coach of Partizan. And that's also a big rivalry between Red Star and Partizan. Partizan so yeah. they also hate a brother each. So, so yeah. it's like double the 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 intents of the of the game. Oh, right. So I, I knew there was something <laughs> extra going on. So um, the game ended up going down to the wire. Right. It came down to the very last possession, and Finner missed the game winning shot, and the crowd stormed the floor. Now I didn't know if they were storming the floor to celebrate or they were storming the floor to <laughs> attack the players. So I run out the gym. <laughs> I run out the gym to like a back door. I catch a cab. I go to the hotel, but I can't understand the news if, if there's anything going on. So I have no idea for at least 30, 40 minutes to maybe an hour. I was trying to figure out, are the guys okay? Nobody was answering their phone, but apparently the team was just celebrating. Red Star fans were just celebrating the win, but that was a pretty cool environment to to be a part of and I, I tell my friends all the time like there's nothing like going to a basketball game in Europe especially Turkey Serbia and Greece and I may be Greece, missing another yes. country but if if it's like a what they call a derby game or a rivalry game there's uh. nothing nothing like it so I really enjoyed that experience all right um you had mentioned earlier that you trained in the states this past summer where did you work out at uh, I work out every uh, every summer. I work out in uh, California, Los Angeles. Okay. Uh, my agency had their headquarters there and their coaches, so I would come there and uh, and work out with uh, draft prospects and you know NBA guys and and G League guys and you know there is a lot of good pickups there and also a lot of good, a lot of uh, strength and conditioning coaches are pretty good and it's mainly working on my body and then. Also, a lot of good coaches um, for uh, skill and basketball and shooting. So that's where I improve my shooting the most, to be honest, in states. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's where I practice every summer. Now, when you play pickup, is, do you feel like there's a big difference between playing American style in a sense than playing in in Europe? I mean, when I play against American guys, I feel like I'm playing against more skilled guys in, in uh, than in Europe. You know what I mean? Like they're they're one on one ISO and and just like shooting the ball. They're way harder to guard to guard one on one, but it's so much easier for me to play there because if I beat my guy, you know I can do whatever I want. Or in defense, it's just one on one. I don't have to rotate from the side and help out everybody. You know it's way different than in Europe. So um, I like to play in transition. You know take transition shots and run all the time and and trying to get the the fast points. Can't really that, do that in Europe all the time, but when we play those pickups, you know, I get those looks every time. So I enjoy the game way more, you know, and 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 it's way more fun for me. You know, I can say it's way more fun for me to play there. Yeah, I, you know, as a person that is from the states, but I've spent a lot of time in Europe. 
I can understand how it can be a little easier in a sense, even though the players in the States are a lot more athletic, but the game isn't as physical. It's more free flowing. Um, yeah. Bigs aren't standing in the paint the entire possession. So it seems like it, it would benefit um, someone that likes to play in a, a free flowing style. All right. When we return, I have a few more questions to ask about this season and going forward. Stay tuned. All right. Last segment. This is Rafael Barlow with Feder. Fedor Zuzic, man, I keep, I gotta get it, I gotta get it right. <laughs> All right, so you, you had mentioned that you spent the summer in the United States and you were training and you were playing against some of the draft guys. Going into this season, is it difficult to like focus on what you have ahead this season, but also having the NBA in the back of your mind? Is is that something that you can find a little bit difficult? I mean, it's definitely a uh, pressure for me, you know, having always all eyes on me every game and just uh pressure of performing good every game uh, but i don't look at it that way you know i just play my game i pretend like you know nobody is caring about what i, I do and you know just, just that's just kind of mindset i go in do my best you know nobody cares if you play good or play bad just play your game you know enjoy when you play and 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 just you know win the game with your teammates give you all and 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 that's it you know i mean the first first year was kind of um it was new for me you know all the nba scouts coming to the game and and all the eyes on you it was it was tough the first year i don't know if i was dealing good with it you know some games i would get a little anxious before the games and stuff but i feel like this year i have way more confidence and you know it's way better i'm way better dealing with that stuff right now Okay, I don't know if you knew. I don't know if somebody had mentioned it to you, but I was talking to your agent last year yeah. about going to a game. And because I was in, I stayed in Barcelona from November until I want to say December. And then everything started kind of getting shut down yeah. late last year because of COVID. And so, uh, and then if, after that, I went to Athens because Athens was a whole lot cheaper to live than than, than Barcelona. <laughs> and then for like, I want to say like the entire month of December, I didn't go to any games because leagues were getting shut down or either they weren't allowing, I think like some teams are only having a capacity of like 10% capacity at the fans, for the fans. So I didn't get a chance to really um, do as much scouting as I wanted to. But I, I did end up going to all of the next to the Adidas Next Generation tournaments. But you were like too good. Well, actually, were you too old for the Next Generation tournaments uh, last year? Because you have played if you were on one of those teams. Last year, I didn't play last year. No. But could you have played age wise? Yeah, yeah. I could have played. I could have played. But you were too good. <laughs> that's what they said <laughs> yeah you, you're too good so so how does it feel like and this is one of the things that you talked about earlier about um the the european players not getting a chance to play on like higher levels so i feel like as as an american on the outside looking in if you're really good in europe as a kid then there's like this period between ages like 18 through like 24 where you can just disappear how how do you like how's your mindset going into that knowing like all right, I've been the best from 15 16 17 yeah. 18 now they're saying that I'm too good to play with my peers now I'm playing on this senior team where I'm behind you know all these guys that they have a family yeah. 26 27 32 yeah. years old how yeah. how does that like affect you like mentally in a sense first you know where I'm from. It's a it's a really tough crowd, and people are not very. You know, uh, let me just say they don't want to see you win. You know what I mean. And um, for young players there, you know, there is a saying like, "Yeah, he is good, but we're gonna see when he turns 18 and he goes pro. Is he gonna disappear or is he gonna, you know, be one of the guys?" And you know, it's very sad to say like 90% of the guys who are really good at 16, 17. You know, just, you know, it happens that they stop playing basketball because wherever they go, they don't get a chance. So for me, the, my biggest fear was uh, first year of not really playing with the professional. It was like, um, you know, I don't want this to happen to me to kind of just like disappear. But I, I worked through all of that. And, you know, when I got a chance, I uh, I used it good. So 
you know, little by little, you have to be patient to get your minutes and you have to be really, really good because they will get the foreigners, they will pay them huge amounts of money. And no matter how good you are, he's going to play him first. And then if something happens, maybe you get a chance, three, four, five minutes. And that may be your only chance you're going to get this year. So you have to use it. And the pressure of, of that is, is, is huge. But I guess I was just, you know, lucky enough and I worked hard enough for me to, to get that chance and, and, and use it uh, three years ago. And uh, after that, they saw that uh, so coach saw that he could trust me. But even after that, it takes a lot of time for you to get your minutes. You know, like you start from five and six, then don't play, then don't play, then 10, then don't play for three games. You know, it's very inconsistent. But, you know, I mean, you just have to stay patient and, and, and wait for your time. Even the first year in Noom, I was really happy with uh, sometimes with what I was getting and what I was doing on the court because it was my first year um, out of home in a new club, in a new environment. And uh, I was getting used to the league. And then sometimes I would play bad. And then the coach wouldn't play me as much the next game. And then you have all these doubts in your mind. Am I good enough for this? What am I doing wrong? You know, but you just, you know, work your way through that and everything is going to be fine. You know, so this year is way, way easier for me because I went through all of that, you know, as a, uh, from these past three years of not playing or not playing uh, enough or playing bad. And uh, I think this year should be uh, the best one so far. Yeah, it's so much different than the States, right? So in the States, it's like, for example, let's say if you were one of the top, I don't know, top players in your age group, right? And you get drafted yeah. to the NBA. You may not be better than this guy that is 27 years old, right? But the yeah. fans are like, we want him. We want Fedor to play because yeah. they don't yeah. want yeah. The, the guy that's 27, 28. They're just like, oh, okay, we've seen enough of him. We're losing. Yeah. We want our young guy. So yeah. it's like the you know, potential is huge in the States, right? So teams want the younger guys to play. Teams want the guy that they just drafted. While in Europe, it's yeah. almost like you're young. You're not ready yet. We don't. <laughs> yeah. We 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 want to make. What I like what I like it. about yeah what I like about draft and 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 like how American teams uh, teams think it's about the potential of a player. You know. Yeah. Like if we play this guy in two or three years, he can be a monster. You know. So we trust the process. You know, it's a process he has to go through. Teams in Europe they are not interested in that. They don't care about the process. Like even if they know you're gonna be monster in three years. They're like, okay, but we're going to lose three years of playing you. You know, that's how they think. And also the fans in States, as you said, they want to see younger guys. But fans in Europe, they, right they don't want to see, they don't want to see an experienced guy on the court. They want to see, uh, they want to see an older guy who maybe is not going to play good as you, but they trust him more than they trust you. They don't want yeah. a young guy on the court. So it's, it's, you have to earn the trust from the coach, from the fans, from management, from the director of the club, from everybody. So I think it's it's way more pressure playing in Europe when you're young than in the States. Yeah, I, I can see both sides of it. I think the pressure in Europe is, um, you know, the fans aren't really as interested in potential. Every game counts. So there's yeah. no reward for losing. It's not like if your team is the worst team, then you're going to end up getting the next best prospect. If you yeah. lose, you're going to get demoted. While in the States, I think that um, the pressure is they draft you and you get a small window because if the team is bad, they're going to have another draft pick, another guy that's a year younger than you that comes in next year. And they're just, you know, like if you look at a team like the Thunder, they have a bunch of young guys, but they're just trying to figure out, okay, which is the, which are the ones that we're going to keep? If you look at Tail Maladon, he was playing a lot for them two years ago. He started a lot of games yeah. for them. They yeah. end up giving up on him. Um, you look at uh, and I can't pronounce his name. I'm sure you know him, Giorgio Scala, <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the yeah. kid from Greece. At the last week of the season last year, they played him like three games over 40 minutes. He averaged like 17 points in nine, but it was more so to lose games so they can get more ping pong balls to try to get the number one pick. And now Giorgio is, is back playing for a Panathinaikos. So it is very 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 different i have this dream scenario and then and, and let me know if this 
if you think this would work in, in Europe. Okay. I have a dream scenario of having a team, maybe a second division team, and I have a bunch of young guys, right? And this is a young young guys where there's teams from the NBA are sending their draft and stash guys to me, or I'm taking like, you know, the like a guy like well your teammate Juan Nunez who was very yeah. good playing for Real Madrid's junior team. There's not a lot of minutes for him. You put him in a situation where you're gonna have freedom. So I have yeah. Yeah. a team of maybe five guys from ages 18 through 22. And then, of course, I have a, some some veterans. So I would, like, take a guy that was, you know, maybe a star in the ACB, and he's 35. He's at the tail end of yeah. his career, but he still wants to play. Do you think a mix like that could be successful? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, there was a lot of attempts to make those teams, but, like, not draft and stash, draft, draft and stash. like, young players with um, – with experienced guys, uh, I know my club uh, in Polgorica, they made a B team with uh, that intent to play me and play other guys and uh, two, three experienced guys, and then just to give us minutes. But what I can tell you is that can well, that was going good for like a year or two. And as soon as they make any progress or win any leagues, when they move up, they're going to give up on all young players and just get another try foreigners. To They'll try to win immediately. So if you would have tried to uh, build that team, you know, I would just tell you to just, you know, keep the young players always, no matter if you move up or move down. You know, it's it's the whole point. I'm going to figure out a way to make it happen <laughs> one of these days. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. This is Fedor Zugic. Zugic one yes. of the best shooters, if not the best shooter in the international class, one of the best shooters overall, period. Remember, if this is your first time hearing the name, remember, in June, you're going to hear the name. You're going to see the name on your TV screen because I think that he is a, a, a definite NBA prospect, definitely somebody that's going to get drafted, only 19 years old, playing professionally in, in the Euro Cup. I'm a big fan. That's why I had to have you on and you know, I've, I've done reports on you for the past couple of years and I've been watching. So I'm excited that um, you, you took time out of your, your busy schedule to come on. Well, that wraps up this episode. Thank you so much for making Locked On Big Boy your first listen of the day or the Locked On NBA Big Boy podcast your first listen of the day. Now, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. The biggest stories of the day plus instant reactions, Big game recaps and the take of the day. And it is available on Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with my guest, Fedor Zuzic. All right, man, Zuzic. And thank yeah, you for tuning right. in. And we are...